Just over a week ago, I was visiting with some of our seniors from next door at Nisbet Lodge during their breakfast hour. And by the way, if you, um, if you would love to volunteer in that way, we actually have an opportunity for you to go over. They have breakfast at 8 o'clock and at 9 o'clock and just share a devotional and, and greet the people. Walk around the tables and greet people as they eat their breakfast. They love that. And I'll just tell you something else. I always leave there more encouraged than when I go. I always, I'm just so uplifted uh, meeting those people that God has sent us. And so uh, you're very welcome. Come and talk to me if you'd like to be involved in that ministry. I know our chaplain, Sean Vandevich, would be so excited if you were able to help out in that way. But I was speaking that morning on a Friday morning on the Lord's Prayer, and I was sharing uh, about my childhood growing up at a Canadian public school. Now, this was back in the day. From kindergarten to grade 10, all the way from kindergarten to grade 10, every single morning, our principal would read the Bible over the PA system, and then I would stand, and we would say the Lord's Prayer together, and then we'd sing the National Anthem. And those are, those are good memories. It's a memory of a kinder, more gentle attitude in our culture and our society towards Christianity in our great nation. And I was reminded of that again the next day. The next day after I was at Nesbitt Lodge, we were at my son's graduation from Bible college, and we sang uh, O Canada. And then a, another verse of O Canada that we don't often sing, um, that's part of the national anthem. In fact, it's a verse that's al almost forgotten, really, in our post-Christian nation. It goes like this. Ruler supreme, who hearest humble prayer, Hold our dominion in thy loving care. Help us to find, O oh God, in thee a lasting rich reward as waiting for the better day we ever stand on guard. God, keep our land glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Now, can you imagine the uproar from secular humanists if we actually sang this at our public gatherings here in Canada uh, today? You know, as Christians, we feel, sometimes in our culture today, we feel marginalized and even lonely in a very radically secularized society. A nation where now, Bible-believing Christians, evangelicals, are portrayed as the ones to be shunned. You know, just a few years ago, I read in the newspaper that a prominent leader of a major political party, I don't name names here, but he proclaimed that Bible-believing Christians, evangelicals, are anti-Canadian, they're un-Canadian. And then most recently, as we've been praying about, our doctors and nurses who are Christian are being increasingly forced to act against their conscience by either actively or even passively uh, assisting people's suicide. I heard just recently that they're having a really difficult time finding medical staff who are willing to do this, and so there's going to come a time, it seems like, that people are going to be forced to do this. Instead of providing good palliative care, as the Bible teaches us in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 6. And under such intimidation, it really makes us, as disciples of Jesus, sometimes it causes us, I, don't say, I shouldn't say it makes us, but it causes us sometimes to fall into one of two extremes. And I'm going to just label them right now. First extreme, I'd say, would be over on one side, would be to quietly close our mouths and stop proclaiming our faith. To quit sharing our belief that the Bible is God's word, and that it has the answer for a sin-soaked world, that would be one extreme. I think the other extreme is just as dangerous, and it's to become rude and rebellious and maybe even revengeful, both against government and anyone that we feel causes us to suffer for our faith. And as we will hear this morning from God's word, we are called to be different but different in a way that brings life and hope to those around us. We've been looking at 1 Peter in our series, Living in the Light of the Cross, and the Apostle Peter, he was writing to believers in Northern Asia Minor who were under fire for their faith. The Roman government, which was ruled by a ruthless Nero, 
saw Christians as a threat and also saw Christians as a, a threat, especially against their pleasure-seeking society. And those who were in those Christians' neighborhoods were watching them very closely to see if they truly were different. Would they cave into societal pressure and give in to illicit sensual pleasures? Would they, would they give in to that? like the rest of the society around them? Were they actively, maybe on the other hand, may they actively resist the government and try to overthrow it like so many others had tried and failed? So yes, the world was watching, and they were waiting to see if these followers of Jesus were truly diff different than they were. And it was during this time that they received this letter from the Apostle Peter who taught these new believers how to live in the light of the cross, to become who they truly were called to be, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, a testimony to the world which was facing some of its worst moral decay in history. And my friends, that is the same message for you and me today as followers of Christ. We're looking today at our testimony to the world. And again, our world is watching how we will respond to pressure. Pressure from both society, pressure from those who are in authority. And Peter t teaches us that while we're being watched, listen to this, while we're being watched, it is the greatest opportunity for us to testify to the gospel. But before we take a look at this passage in 1 Peter, we need to pray and to pause and just ask God for his help. Let's pray together. Father, we confess to you this morning that we need your help. And again, we confess to you that sometimes the hedonism of our pleasure-seeking world, secular spirit of our country, which is rejecting your son Jesus, is a, it is a struggle for us. But this morning, teach us through your word how to testify to the world in a way that is attractive. We need your Holy Spirit's help this morning. So would you speak to us as we look at your word? In Jesus' name, amen. So I encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 25. And if you're looking for that passage of Scripture, you can find it. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's a blue Bible somewhere in front of you. 858 will take you to our passage today. And you can also follow along in the notes in your bulletin if you received one when you came in this morning. This morning, we're going to start by reading 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And this really is a summary of everything that's to come for the next several chapters. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that Though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now here's what the Apostle Peter wants us to know about testifying to the gospel while living in a very dark world. And it's a world that's often suspicious, it's often hostile towards Christians. And first of all, it's this, in testifying to the gospel, we recognize that we are called to be different. Now, how are we different? Well, first, Peter says we are strangers in the world. And that's very important for us to recognize. See, already way back in chapter 1, verse 1, Peter identified us as being strangers in this world. And here he calls us aliens and strangers. And these terms were actually the terms that were used by about Abraham in Genesis chapter 23, Verse 4, when he had no property to bury his wife, he was considered himself to be an alien and a stranger. And then Psalm chapter 38, verse 13, repeated these terms when it reminded believers how short their life really is. And here, Peter's reminding us that this is not our permanent home. In fact, Peter in his second letter added this, 2 Peter 3, 13. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven 
and the new earth, the home of righteousness. Now, why is this so important to Peter? Because we are called to be different. We're called to be a holy nation, a holy nation that our gaze is fixed on our homeland. And I was thinking about this as I was reading this this week. Perhaps Peter was thinking about, as his Bible was the Old Testament, he was thinking about the prophet Daniel. Do you remember Daniel in the Old Testament? He was far from home in Babylon, which was a very hostile environment for him. And Daniel would, if you remember, he would go to his window three times a day, and he would pray in his open window uh, towards Jerusalem. Why did he do that? Well, Daniel recognized that he was called to be different, that he was an alien and he was a stranger where God had placed him. In fact, that realization made Daniel and his three friends refuse Daniel chapter 1, to defile themselves. It's interesting, the author of Hebrews in the Bible writes something very similar about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11 in the faith chapter. Verse 13 says, the Old Testament heroes of the faith admitted that they were aliens and strangers on this earth. In verse 24, we find this statement, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Why? Because he was looking forward to his reward. And so when facing fire for our faith, we're much less to compromise and fall into temptation when we recognize, when we're constantly realizing that we are strangers in this world, that our ultimate citizenship, our ultimate loyalty lies somewhere completely different. So that's the first one. Second thing is, we're different as we abstain from sinful desires, and that's a, a command in this passage. Literally, the, Peter, the term Peter uses here is desires of the flesh. That's what it literally means. Now, some people, when they think of desires of the flesh, they always think of this term as something like a, a sexual sin or another sin of the flesh, like drunkenness, and it does include those sins, but many more than that. In fact, the term means any natural desires that we have that are apart from the work of the Spirit. Now, we already identified some of those, didn't we, back in chapter 2, verse 1. A few weeks ago, remember some of those things? Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Includes a whole range of things. And this is a command from the Apostle Peter, abstain from these fleshly desires, these sinful desires. But let me just add one, one thing that the Apostle Peter recognized, and that's these sinful desires are impossible to abstain from without the help of God, without the help of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural help of the Lord. It's not an easy command, by the way. We can't just pass over this and say, well, that's check that one off the list. It's not easy. In fact, Peter says, what does he say? He says, we're in a war. These desires of the flesh war against us. We're in a war. We celebrate this year the 500th year of the Reformation, and Martin Luther described the war this way. He said, as soon as the spirit and faith enter into our hearts, we become so weak that we think that we cannot beat down the least imaginations and sparks of temptation. And we see nothing but sin in ourselves from the crown of the head even to the foot. For we, before we believed, we walked according to our own lusts. But now the Spirit has come and would purify us, and a conflict arises when the devil, the flesh, and the world oppose our faith. There's a war going on. In other words, we're different. We're different from the rest of the world, and we're fighting in a war, a combat against our very souls. And and by the way, knowing that we're in that combat, that helps us as well. It helps us understand why the temptations sometimes come so fast and so furious against us as God's children. And yet we remember this. Remember this passage, this promise from God, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and 14. No temptation has seized you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. 
God promises to help us. But we do have to do our part, right? It says that we have to flee those things that tempt us. We don't just stand around. We get out of there. We take the escape route that God's provided for us. Now here's Peter's point. The world will recognize right away if you are different than they are. If you flee temptation instead of indulging in sinful behavior that the world hands to you, the sinful addiction. And you know, some people will watch you, and when they see you resisting temptation, often they will come to you and they'll say, you know what, I need help. You've got something I don't have. And so then you have an opportunity to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't just say, well, was, I, I just have this inner strength. No, you share with them the gospel, where that came from. So abstaining from sinful desires by fleeing things that war against our soul, that's the negative half of the command. But then the positive half of the command also recognizes how different we are. And it says, the next part is this, we change people's minds by our good conduct. Verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We don't change people's minds through fighting with them. It's by our good behavior. The Lord uses that in their lives as they watch us. Scholars believe that the terms glorify God points to the salvation of unbelievers. Paul uses the same term in Romans chapter 15, verse 9, when he speaks of the Gentiles glorifying God because of his mercy. In other words, some who were once hostile may turn to Christ because of watching your good behavior. You know, in Peter's day, it was difficult. It was very difficult. Believers did not honor the typical gods in the community, and so they were naturally viewed as subversive. They were naturally viewed as evil, and they were called evil. It's interesting, they were even called atheists. Believers were called atheists because they didn't believe in all the multiple gods that were around them. Peter didn't call the believers, interesting, to a verbal campaign of, of, of self-defense. He didn't cause them to uh, write tracts that defended their morality and hand them out. He commanded them to pursue good behavior. Why? so that their goodness would actually stand out in their society. You know, I've heard testimonies of people who have doubted, doubted Christianity. They've doubted Christ, and they've had their minds completely transformed, completely changed by just watching followers of Jesus. I heard of an agnostic reporter who visited Africa to find out that those who were on the front lines of, of fighting Ebola and AIDS were Christians like this Christian doctor on the front of the Time magazine, the Ebola fighters, person of the year. Or I heard about an alcoholic who came home in a drunken stupor and he was outside the door of his house and he was a very abusive man and he, he listened at the door, he heard something in the, inside the, the kitchen and it was his wife down on her knees praying for him. And he came in sobbing in tears. Why would you pray for me? I heard about an award-winning investigative journalist, an atheist, whose spouse's life was dramatically changed after, he met, after she met Christ, and now he's a leading defender of the faith. In fact, there's a mo major motion picture coming out about his testimony. Peter remembered hearing Jesus' words. I'm sure they were ringing in his mind as he was reading this, as he was writing this. Matthew 5.16, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, and praise your Father in heaven. And so we testify to the power of the gospel by being different. Strangers and aliens. This world is not our home. Recognizing that we, as we abstain from evil desires that many in this world indulge in, that we'll be watched. But not just abstaining. It means living our life with such good conduct that people's minds are changed about Jesus Christ. And now, the Apostle Peter uh, changes a little bit, and he actually talks about specifics. See, it's nice to talk about this kind of in general terms, and say, yeah, I'm going to do that. But now he start, ta starts talking about things that are very difficult to, to obey. He lists commands that, if obeyed, 
will silence public critics because they are so different. Here's Peter's next strategy in testifying to the gospel to a hostile world. We submit to the authorities that God has placed over us. Now today, it's just as popular to rail against authorities as it was back in Peter's day. In fact, maybe even more so. And here, God's word calls us to be different from the world and the way that we respond to authority. Follow along as I read 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be going now verse 13 to 17. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether it be to the king, as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers, which we looked at last week. Fear God. Honor the king. Wow. What does it mean to submit yourself to the authority of the government? You know what it means? It means to be upstanding, law-abiding citizens. Not seeing how much you can get away with. I was convicted as I read this passage this week. Not slamming on the bla- your brakes when you see a police car. It means paying your tax bills. But it goes beyond that. It means showing respect to those who are in authority in our society. You know, in Roman times, Jesus' followers were actually tempted to think that because God was their Lord now, not Caesar, that this exempted them from the government's laws. And we know that because in a similar passage was written by the Apostle Paul. This was a widespread problem. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. A few verses later, he says, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. It's kind of similar to our passage in 1 Peter. So why should we submit to the authority of the government? Well, first of all, in our passage, in verse 15, it says, it is God's will. And that should be enough, shouldn't it? But it's also a matter of our testimony to the world. Verse 15 says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Brothers and sisters, your neighbors are watching you as they are watching me. And some of your neighbors are suspicious of Christianity, and they saw you this morning leaving for church. And if you break the law, they will have reason to point their finger at you and say, see, it's totally a sham. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. But if you live above reproach and you respect authority, they will be silenced, and maybe they will listen to you when you share the gospel or when you invite them to your church. And some people may say, well, I'm free in Christ. He is my only authority. Pastor Daniel, you taught us from God's word that God is my father and that I'm co-heirs with Christ. I'm seated in the heavenlies. Yes, that's true. We did discover that, didn't we? But Peter says that we don't use that freedom as a cover-up for evil. You you see, there's a story in the Gospels where Jesus pointed out that our freedom shouldn't cause us to evade submission to authority. And I'm sure it actually stood out in Peter's mind as he was writing this letter. It's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 27 to 24 to 27. Listen to this. After Jesus and his disciples arrived at Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma coin tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. But 
so that we may not offend them. Go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. It's kind of an interesting story, isn't it? Jesus is saying, yes, yes, you're under a different kingdom. You're God's child. You are waiting for the eternal kingdom on a recreated heaven and earth. But in the meantime, you're subjected to the same rules and laws as everyone else. See, God has placed them in authority over us for a reason. And we, above all people, should be above reproach in front of the watching world. Now, there is one qualification. I have to put this in here. Peter said in our passage, verse 13, that we submit to the government for the Lord's sake. Not for their sake, for the Lord's sake. Verse 17 says that while we honor the king, we only fear God. In Acts chapter 4, verse 18 through 20, the temple authorities commanded Peter and the apostles to no longer speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Now remember, this is the same Peter that's writing this passage. And what does he say? Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. In another passage, he said, we ought to obey God rather than man. So how do we know? How do we know when we're to obey and submit to government authorities, God-ordained authorities? Well, the New Testament writers would say, we obey unless God tells us otherwise in his word. In every other case, we obey and we submit. Now, that raises a question among brothers and sisters of ours in places in the world that's a very, very difficult to live. North Korea, one of them. Places where they face violent persecution. And when they have to make that choice, how do they respond when they are so unjustly treated by society? And I'm going to say that rarely happens here in Canada. Very rarely. There's very few examples I could think of this week. I know of uh, some medical staff who refused to participate in abortion, that they weren't officially let go because of their religious belief, beliefs. That's illegal here in Canada. You can't be let go because of your religious beliefs. But their work supervisors use more subtle ways to push them out. And that may happen. That may end up happening in the case that we, I talked about earlier about uh, conscientiously objecting to medically assisted suicide. Maybe there will be no recourse in the law. There usually is. But what then? What happens if everyone rules against you because of your faith in Christ, because of your stand for Jesus? What then? Well, the fleshly response inside of us would be to have just bitterness and vengeance, a spirit of, of retribution. But that's not living in the light of the cross. In fact, Peter uses the most extreme case from his time period to make a point. He uses the example of slaves who have become believers, some of the most downcast and downtrodden in that society. And if you doubt that, listen to what Seneca wrote during that time period. He says, you may take a slave in chains and at your pleasure expose him to every test of endurance, but too great violence in the striker has often dislocated a joint or left a sinew fastened in the very teeth that is broken. Anger has left many a man crippled, many disabled, even when it found its victim submissive. And so it was brutal for slaves back then. Now imagine a slave who had become a believer in Christ with a wicked owner. Imagine that. How difficult that would be. Now before I read what Peter writes next, let me remind you that nowhere in Scripture is slavery normalized. I had to write a paper on that, a, book, a little booklet. And if you're interested in reading that, it's, it's a little more scholarly. You can... You can take a look at that. Just ask me for it. Yet the New Testament writers did not believe that the overhauling social structure, that that was their number one priority. They didn't believe that that's what would transform culture. Their concern really was the relationship of people to God, and they often and most often focused on sin and rebelling against God and the Creator. And so the New Testament writers concentrated on the biblical response of believers to mistreatment. And so that's what's going on in this next command. Follow along as I read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 to 25. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, 
not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Do you recognize some of the passages that he's quoting from? Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. Here's the Apostle Peter's point. We suffer for Christ without revenge or retaliation. Now, in this passage, the exhortation is addressed to slaves, but slaves really function here in this passage as examples for all followers of Jesus. You see, there were few believers in the Roman Empire that suffered as much as Christian slaves did. Roman slaves. And some were actually, they had to disobey because of their new allegiance to Christ. Some of their masters would take them and want to force them to be involved in pagan worship. And they had stood up against that. They no longer participated in the pagan worship. That led to incredible suffering. When Peter says, it's commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God, the term Literally, in the original language, says this is grace. This is grace. It was grace if those slaves endured pain while suffering unfairly. Not saving grace, but the grace of God that he empowered them, imparted to them. Strength under suffering. And by the way, he added, not suffering for doing wrong. We're not, just talk, we're not talking about suffering because you've done something evil. Suffering for Christ. And then verse 21 begins. Reminding believers that all of us, all of us are called to suffer. And then he turns to Jesus Christ as our example to be imitated, not in his atonement for sin that's already been accomplished, but our suffering may follow Christ's example in leading believers to repentance and conversion. And here Peter turns to Isaiah 53, an example of suffering. And did you notice in the prophecies of, prophecies of Isaiah that the coming Christ would not retaliate, he wouldn't make threats. You know how hard that is to do? If someone's causing you to suffer unjustly, do you know how hard it is to not make threats back? Not to retaliate? But we know instead, what did he say from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now tell me, is that response natural or supernatural? It has to be supernatural. And what impact did that statement and, and the way Jesus died have on the, one of the thieves that was beside him on the cross? He was saved. What, what impact did it have on the centurion and his detachment responsible for his crucifixion? Both Matthew and Mark testify to their response. In fact, Mark 15, 39 says, And when the centurion, in Matthew it says actually the centurion and his soldiers, who stood there in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. When we live in the light of the cross, Peter says, we respond the same way that Jesus did when we face unjust suffering, when we suffer for the sake of Christ. We obey Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 47 says this, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? But if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? What is Jesus saying? When we love our enemy, something very different is going on than the rest of the world. We're different. It's going to cause people to take notice. 
In other words, we testify to the life-changing power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us when we suffer for Christ without revenge, without retaliation. This morning as we close, I'd like us to reflect on the words of one of the greatest preachers to live in the last 150 years, Charles Spurgeon. And he said this, Do you know what the Bible, the wicked, and the worldly man reads? He does not read this Bible at all. He reads the Christian. And he added later in his sermon, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, say within yourself, I must so live and die that I might confirm the witness of Christ. I must so walk among my friends and neighbors that they will see there is a truth and power in my faith. And let me warn you not to undertake this in your own strength. You will want fresh power from on high from the Holy Spirit. Get a fresh supply of grace at the throne. No, we aren't suffering nearly like the first century church under Nero or the believers living in North Korea and Afghanistan. And yet we still have some of the same temptations, don't we? We have the temptations to give in to the fleshly desires of the world around us. We have the temptation to criticize and condemn the government instead of praying for them to retaliate, to get revenge when we're treated unjustly by the unbelieving world instead of patiently suffering for Christ's sake. As the fourth verse of O Canada says, help us to find, O God, in Thee a lasting rich reward as waiting for the better day we ever stand on guard. No, evangelical, Bible-believing Christians are not un-Canadian. We're standing on guard for our nation with the help of Almighty God Himself. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, this morning, help us live our testimony to the world. You have called us to be different, strangers and aliens in this world. And yet, while we are here, You've given us the greatest task of all, to hold out the gospel, both in word and in deed. And help us be the most gracious people that our neighbors have ever met. Help us live holy lives, free from grudges and grumbling that your name may be glorified in our nation once again. In Jesus' precious and powerful name we pray this. Amen.